Welcome to today's Echo Voices session with Jason Smith from PRC Saltillo with focus on access. Jason, I'm going to relinquish the screen and give it back to you and let you tell us all about switches and buttons and ports and all that fun stuff. Okay. All right. I'll try to make sure to use the word ports. I didn't talk about it. I, didn't, I don't know if I have that. <laughs> main, but thank you very much, Chandra. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about all about access. Um, actually, I'll be presenting to you from a training that we actually do uh, live with a uh, very hands-on uh, approach with uh, through all the access methods that are available on PRC Saltillo devices. It's called the All Access Course, and I actually accidentally left in the name Empower there. We uh, you know can take you through this through our Empower software on our de Accent devices or also on our Saltillo devices. But um, I'm going to be presenting notes from that today, uh, presenting slides from that presentation, and of course, minus the hands-on component. But um, if you'd like that training, by all means, reach out to me and we can do that in your area. Uh, the notes that I uploaded though are just a short, a pretty condensed outline of uh, the different access methods for you to take notes along to or just use as a brief set of notes as well. All right, let's see if I can actually move my slides. Oh boy, I think we'll do that. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Smith. Uh, I am a speech therapist, but I've been an AAC consultant at PRC Saltillo for the past 10 plus years. So I'm a salaried employee owner there. And uh, I am a SIG 12 member. That's the AAC member uh, or special interest group at ASHA, our uh, National Speech and Hearing Association. And uh, Chandra, I believe you're going to be watching chat for me. So I'll, I'm going to try to ignore that. Yes, sir. Uh, so for some quick learning outcomes, uh, what are we going to be doing here? So I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit of advocacy of my own. Uh, I'm Deb's big on advocacy here, but communication with an AAC device or access to it, which comes first? Uh, I will definitely talk about that a little bit. Then we're going, you're going to be able to briefly describe at least four common AAC access methods. And then hopefully you'll know the difference between auto scanning and step scanning if you don't already know that. So this is a pretty uh, you know, general overview, a survey of a lot of different access methods and really the settings that you might come across. So to answer that uh, first question, we believe that you know access comes before communication. You simply cannot do something well on a device if you cannot access that device and make things happen on it. So um, we have this little access before communication. And so the motivation for this type of talk is to help you understand what's available and at least plant the seeds to make you aware that we really do have, and, and I'm referring to all of us in the field of AAC, all of us, all of us vendors that make these products, um, you know, understand what's available, what's coming down the, the pipeline even and what customization options are there to really meet your client where they're at and get them access to that device. You need to have an understanding at least of the possible adjustments that you can make to improve their access, to improve their ability to communicate independently with the device. And so we try to provide independence through access. We're gonna be looking today at touch head tracking, eye tracking, and scanning. Um, I'll briefly mention, you know, joystick and, and BCI. If you don't know that, I'll even leave that as a teaser, uh, what that stands for. But the goal for any access method is for our users to be able to achieve communication independence to whatever degree they can get to. We really want them to be able to say what they need to say, what they want to say as much as possible. Okay. So when you're thinking about access methods, just a really quick set of, of key things to think about um, when, when trying to decide on an access method for a user is, can they do it volitionally? Can they interact with that access method on their own? 
we want them to be initiating and, and doing this from the user, not simply in response to us or really with our moving or prompting or, or guiding them through it. Can they do that movement volitionally? Can they be consistent with that access method? Can they execute the necessary movements in, in, this, in the same fashion each time? And can they repeat the movement without risk of fatigue or inaccuracy? Every time they do the movement, are they going somewhere else? Are, does that movement take so long that they either lose attention to what they're doing or they simply fatigue because it's so so much work to do. So vol volitional movement, consistent movement, and repeatable movement without fatigue or, or failure. Those are the kind of key features to be thinking of, key factors to be thinking about when assessing an access method for a user. And I do not have a clock on my screen, so I better have something there. All right. So, uh, I'm sorry. It's so 813. 813. That's what I got here too. Good. Um, okay. So we're going to start off. We're going to do, like I said, those four access methods. I will try to make sure to check in with Chandra for any questions. I'll, I'll take a break at the end of each section so anyone can ask any questions about those sections. But certainly along the way, feel free to add uh, questions to the chat and, and Chandra will keep track of those. So touch, which... Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this this morning. It's like, in a way, touch is kind of the most recent access method for our population in AAC land, if you think of it historically, because most of the time, the reason we had to get these types of make these types of devices for people was that they couldn't just do a keyboard or couldn't just, well, and it was before touch screens when we started doing all this back in the 60s and 70s. So, um, so it was it's actually one of the later ones, but yet now it is by far the most common access method, right? We have a lot of users who use that. So um, nowadays it's all capacitive screens that re react to contact. And so you need good electrical contact. If some of you have seen some, we know sometimes gloves or uh, certain styluses don't react well with certain screens. Um, but you can be at, you can be accessing this directly with a finger a stylus, or other body parts. A lot of kiddos, you'll see, they'll try to use it with their nose. Um, others use it with their toes. And I have uh, users that use the, the base of their wrist. So whatever, again, they can volitionally, repeatedly, consistently do, we're going to use that. Common accessories, key guards, and touch guides. And did I grab any of those to have on hand? Of course not. But I do have a pretty common key guard right here. This is a key guard, a grid that fits over the screen and lines up with the buttons that you have on the screen. Uh, touch guides are uh, slimmer, thinner, and there's other even varieties in between that kind of mix those up. Uh, some advanced users who are you know, very fluent adults on AAC devices, fluent users of touch, they, they kind of advocate that everyone that uses touch get a get a key guard. We often think of it as just to help with accuracy for users, but uh, it also provides additional tactile feedback for every user that, you know, when, when we get to use our keyboards, we're getting a very thorough tactile experience. And most of us still tend to want to use our keyboards for the bulk of our writing commute style communication and you're getting force feedback and you're getting the feeling of the keys whether they're rough or smooth and things like that those glass screens they don't give you a lot of feedback and it can actually be really beneficial i've seen things that seem darn near magical uh happen with users who don't seem you know oh yeah she runs her ipad all day long so but yes, every time she touches it, maybe she kind of jams into the, the, the screen and bounces on it a lot. That can be a real problem on an AAC device if you're accidentally picking buttons multiple times. So key guards or touch guides should not be dismissed out of hand, even when users have really good uh, general motor skills. Hey, look, there's the picture of one right there, flipped up. Um, 
And there's the touch guide. So it's slimmer, tends to have um, uh, more round or oval holes. And you, you can, to, it, it's really a matter of preference. It can be uh, a situation where certain motor skills uh, differences, you know, they just work with that better than with, uh, some people can get hung up on these uh, buttons in here. If you've got certain types of motor issues, you can get hung up on these screens or on these uh, grid pieces. In fact, the user that I mentioned earlier, who uses the kind of the base of her wrist, she uses this because her skin will go through that slimmer hole while it can't do that on the thicker key guard. So a lot of variation, a lot of uh, flexibility out there. Okay, another, you know, we, we often again think, oh, touch, the, the, the kiddo can run an iPad just fine. You know, what are any, other, there's nothing else to be done, right? Just give them the device, give them the language system and off you go, send them to the speech therapist. Um, but there are actually a lot of touch customizations that we do for a lot of different reasons. So we're gonna go through these in a little, little slower pace here. Uh, we're going to talk about button selection time, next button selection delay, activate on release, and then we'll talk about selection feedback. We always, uh, we usually want to give some feedback to what did I, did I actually hit the screen? Did I hit that button? We like that on all of our, our systems. Button selection time is really telling the computer, okay, how long does the computer have to detect a touch at one location on the screen? to say, yep, you meant to hit that. And so let's see how this plays here. So we got this finger, oh gosh, I'm actually aiming for the drink button, but on the way there, I hit that thumbs down button and I kind of bounced over there. And I really wanted that one. So you can set it so that, and, and so by default, your average touchscreen is gonna accept you know, instantaneously. And that's what a lot of us are used to and uh, that use touch screens and also a lot of our kiddos who have had these. But they can get very frustrated if they accidentally brush the screen on their way to a button. So with button selection time, you can increase that. And then this is showing what it would look like if it's adjusted. Oh, that first tap on bad is not going to work, but I really mean drink. And now it selects it. Now, honestly, unless you have, uh, unless the user has CP or something more uh, profound like that, a profound motor impairment, I'm usually not changing this one. Uh, just because a lot of kiddos who use touch have had touch screen experience before now and um, are, are pretty used to that screen responding instantaneously. But um, sometimes this is a necessary setting to change. The next one, next button selection delay is one way you'll hear it called. You'll also see something called uh, release time. Actually, I should have mentioned back here on button selection time, another word you'll see for this, and I did put that in the notes, is dwell time. It's That's actually a word we tend to use more for eye and head tracking, but you'll see it used in, I believe, our apps. Uh, it's called dwell time. So that button selection time or dwell time, how long am I touching on a button before it selects? Here, next button selection delay, this is a setting I do more commonly adjust even for our kiddos with really good motor skills, uh, fine motor skills with their hands. And this one is, but it's also for those with impaired motor who might accidentally bounce on a button a lot. So, oh gosh, oops, oops, I, I wanted to just hit that once, but for whatever reason, I bounced on the screen. Um, or, I'm a kiddo that's used to the screen kind of doing whatever I say whenever I want, and I'm, I'm hitting it really fast. And we maybe want to extinguish that kind of behavior on a communication system. So in that case, we increase the next button selection delay, and we say, okay, the computer's accepted, the touch has happened. Now, how long is this, the computer going to ignore screen touches? And so we usually, you know, if I'm setting that for, a, a you know, a kiddo with typical motor skills, I'm only going to go as high as like 0.4 or 0.5 seconds. Um, but then that will do something like this, where even if they bounce, it's only picking it one time. It's not picking it each time that they hit that button. And when you have systems in which you're navigating to multiple screens, that button, you know, hitting that same spot multiple times can have completely unrelated things happening in some systems. Jason? Uh, you, Oh, yes, go ahead. 
Um, we have a question. Is Have you heard this also called release time? Yes, release or... time, exactly. Yeah, that's what Perfect. we... Uh, that's what we called it actually in our older new voice software. And yeah, you'll still see that out there. So exactly. Release time. Okay. The next, okay. Next setting. Uh, this is activate on release. And you, so basically you have two options. You either have activate on touch, you know, that's the typical behavior of all of our touch screens. That's the default behavior. But again, if there are some users that can maybe easily get onto a screen, but they can't go straight to their target until they get on the screen, and then they can slide to that target. And that's what this is going to show. So if I'm, I don't remember what the button they're going for here, maybe it's drink again. But here they're sliding across the screen. Normally, that's going to activate a bunch of areas on the screen, or it might not activate anything after the first one, right? That's how often they work now. But if I set activate on release, then the user can get their finger on the screen and then slide that didn't make it clear that they got on the screen at the stop sign and then they release. So they got on over here, slid over to their target, let go. And that's when the computer said, okay, that, that's the button you wanted. And um, again, so that one doesn't work with key guards or touch guides. That's an important thing to notice. Um, I've maybe had a couple users over um, my career that have had to use that type of setting or have preferred that type of setting, really. Um, that's you know where they prefer to do that instead of use a key guard because they're, they're consistent and repeatable easy movement was just uh, get my hand out onto the screen into the same spot and then I can move it with control by I, I'm using the leverage against that screen to help stabilize my movement. So that's a setting that's available on all of our devices and apps. So it's, a, it's, it's there if need be. Okay. Um, now, one another important thing, especially it's still for touch users, although again, we talk about this, we think about this more in terms of eye gaze or switch users and such, but selection feedback can be really important for our users. Again, because that touch screen from a tactile perspective isn't always giving you a lot of feedback, uh, we do like to let the users know, okay, we, we have multiple ways to let the users know that, oh, right, you made a selection. Now, one of the more obvious ones is that often it puts the text up into that top area that's on most communication systems. But in some communication systems, particularly like our, our specialty min speak systems like LAMP and Unity, you're often doing button sequences. And before it says a word, you're almost kind of spelling the word. So sometimes you, you definitely want the screen to give you some indication that, yep, I, I acknowledge you pressed that button. I've done the right thing in response to that. So you usually have, um, you know, you have visual feedback and you have auditory feedback. There's a third one called tactile feedback, which is still pretty inconsistent in the field. We've had devices that have it a little bit, a little vibration that it can give you when you touch the screen, but that just hasn't, there just hasn't been enough demand for that, it seems, that, that it's really made it into being a common product, product on devices. But here you can see, and again, so the examples in here are gonna be from our Empower software on our Accent devices, but you generally have most of these feedback types available in any you know, quality AAC system. So for example, up here, uh, you're seeing that you can have none. It does nothing visually. Uh, a very common one that I use is invert. It inverts the color of the screen and you're seeing here that when it's showing you up here that that white button is gonna have a black background when you successfully touched it. It's gonna let you know that. Sometimes we just have the border change. You know, it turns to a bright red or, or orange border, or you can do a different fill color. You can say, I want the button to turn light red when I ever, whenever I hit it to let me know because I really see that color well, and that lets me know that I hit that button. So that can be really important for a lot of users. Uh, the beep, just getting a little beep, boop, Boop, whenever you hit a button, that can be really useful. Um, it can also 
potentially be um, distracting and, and I won't say dangerous isn't quite the right word, but you know, it can be an obstacle for some of our users. I'm particularly thinking of, of users with autism for whom sometimes we think, wow, they're really into that screen, but what they're doing is they're having fun playing, you know, little DJ and making the beeps go and seeing how fast they can make them go and what patterns and such. And they're attending to the beep instead of the communication. So sometimes we turn that off um, or a lot of times we turn it off in some of our apps, it's more of a click sound and a beep, but uh, that's that's a common setting in here. We, we have the beep volume, but it's just separate feedback from speech because sometimes we don't always have the speech output on or sometimes the user just isn't used to the speech output as a thing yet. And so they have to, uh, they need that additional visual or auditory feedback. Okay, so some of the clinical, just kind of wrapping up on touch here, um, some, some clinical considerations. Uh, we definitely encourage avoiding the, uh, the kind of naive approach of, oh gosh, my kiddo is new to AAC, uh, I, I, or he has some sort of motor or visual impairment, I'm just going to use really big buttons and go with that. I'm sorry, I see a question from Chelsea who has her hand raised and everything. Can I go ahead and answer that one? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Chelsea, yourself. do you want to unmute yourself and ask yeah. the question? Um, is there an option of kind of uh, combining where the student uh, touches, it reads the icon auditorily but doesn't select it, and then a second touch selects? Um, in, that's the one that is not as consistent, uh, consistently applicable in systems, but yes, that's called auditory prompts. Um, that's again, more typical with touch, um, but I do understand that some systems even have it with eye tracking. And yes, we do have that available in touch as well. Okay. So yes, that is, that's a frequent one, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, discuss that one. There can be there can be trickinesses with that. So there might, and there might be other ways to approach that. So, but yes, that is an option. Um, but yes, so we, we often encourage use the smallest size button that an individual can physically and visually access and really start with the, if, if possible, start with the most mature keyboard that you can and then use other tools like hiding and showing and button spacing and key guards to improve their access to that. Uh, what we, what, what kind of the old way used to be was, oh, I'm gonna just start with uh, four big buttons here because this user's never experienced AAC or done any talking. So we're gonna start simple. And um, what we end up doing is first, if, if you're gonna say more than four words with four buttons, you're going to have to hit a lot of buttons and it becomes very complex actually. But also if it just says four words, well, you're going to spend a lot of time getting that four word system going and then they're gonna want more than four words and you're gonna throw it out. And you're constantly teaching, throwing out, teaching, throwing out. We say aim high from the start, get that smallest button that they can reliably, consistently, volitionally hit and um, and then build up to revealing or utilizing that full vocabulary as you're going on. But kind of start with the, the kind of the button size that you're aiming at. Now, I will talk about some exceptions to that when it comes to, for, for example, eye tracking and such. But when it comes to touch, try to just get the button size they can handle now and uh, build up in terms of distance density. So for example, in, in PRC systems, we have Vocabulary Builder, which is a very powerful hiding and showing feature where you can say, you know, here's a list of words, only show those for now. And you learn them exactly where they will be, but you won't, you know, see everything at once. Um, and I might even have an example. Uh, button padding, that's a way of kind of making the buttons look more button-like. If you're just peeking at this screen over here uh, on, on the left, if you saw, you know, if I took off the key guard there, that's really kind of a wall of white and you don't really see buttons so much unless you have actual button padding put in, which kind of shrinks the buttons to the center. I'll, I'll be showing you a picture of that here in a second. Uh, size of the, device, of the device clearly matters. 
A larger screen is going to give you more buttons, true, especially for a given size, but then it might be more range of motion required, which could be fatiguing. Again, I'm thinking more of a CP user in this case. A uh, smaller screen, we all love our, we, we want everything to be small, light, fit in our pockets, do that, but then I'm going to have to have bigger buttons. And bigger buttons usually means more buttons to hit for the same amount of vocabulary. So there's all those kind of factors to, to be considering. So we're trying to find that balance between amount of vocabulary and portability, but also, again, that ability to consistently, reliably uh, access the device. And of course, I see that we have an OT on here, so I'm going to uh, say definitely encourage the use of hands for other activities um, and, and do all the, all the things. Get your OT and PT input on um, really on positioning, you know, so I'm talking about touch and probably a lot of us in our heads are thinking of our, our typical, you know, mobile users, you know, using an app on an iPad. But when it comes to more complex touch systems, you really do want the input of the whole team because positioning does matter in all those cases. Okay. So I'm going to skip the video. If we have time, I might come back to that because I feel like I'm a little, little behind time here. So any questions on touch before I move on here? I do see them questions in the chat. Yes, for, for visually impaired students, Deborah, we even have more, we, we have other things we do. We get really creative with these uh, key guards. We'll put like gorilla tape, not gorilla tape. Um, I put gaffer's tape over the top and then cut out holes in it so they can get their hand onto the device and kind of poke through. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do. We have uh, many options of that. Auditory prompting, phishing, yep. Uh, okay. Any other questions? If not, I think I'll keep going on here. You're doing great. We're Hi. doing okay on time. All right. And so, oh, oh, <laughs> I thought your mouth moved, Shandra, and I thought, it, but I is what I did is I started the video that I said I wasn't going to start. All right. Head tracking is going to be number two. Uh, that... So this is this is kind of the more traditional head tracking approach, but head tracking is essentially a system where we get to use our head to run the, the cursor on the screen. We use our head to emulate using a mouse uh, that we're typically used to. And this can actually be um, a little bit more intuitive for users uh, than, than eye tracking because we do use our head as a limb. We do tend to turn our head and, and point at things with it and indicate you know, our gaze. We say eye gaze, but really we're turning our whole head most of the time when we're using uh, eye direction to, to make joint eye contact or joint, I mean, I'm forgetting my word there, but. So head tracking that camera on the top in this traditional form is usually tracking, in this case, a silver dot, highly reflective dot that's placed on the glasses or the forehead or sometimes on the brim of a cap. But there are actually many other forms. Um, I don't have pictures of all of those, but um, the they are ones like, uh, there are there's a gyroscopic version. Gyroscopic, I don't even know if that's the right word. Um, but basically, um, you wear a little earpiece. It's the Qha Zono. I don't know if people have seen that one. Um, that is basically uh, you wear it almost like an earpiece or on a on a, a headphone head holder. Um, but it's actually pretty flexible. You can some people even use it with their hand, and it's actually an accelerometer. A tilt, you know, it's doing the tilt detection, and it can track your head in space, and then talks via Bluetooth to the device and runs the mouse around the screen, but that's usually considered a head tracking method. Um, other ones on iOS now are just using the built-in uh, cameras of, of the iPad itself, and they're really doing facial tracking. And so that's available, you know, head tracking is available in our apps. Um, I'm pretty sure in, the, in other companies' apps as well. And that amazingly doesn't even require um, doesn't require the dot, 
the reflective dot. It's just really doing face tracking. Now, in darker situations, it's not as robust and you don't have as many controls, but it's getting really good. Um, there, are, there are users out there that are able to use, you know, 60 or 84 buttons with head tracking on, you know, a, an 11 inch iPad. Selections are made by dwelling. That's kind of that button selection time that we were talking about with touch, where you get the mouse cursor or pointer onto the button you want, and you linger there. Um, but, and, and that's, that's the most typical way with the traditional head mice. Um, but you can also use a switch if you've got a second, you know, if you've got a reliable way to hit a light switch that doesn't move your head at the same time, you can, again, you're kind of clicking with your hand or, or a knee, as some users have done. Um, but again, with the end blinking is a one that's is one that's also common on traditional systems. On the camera based ones on iOS you can actually use a smile or a frown or some other facial gesture. As long as you can do that facial gesture without moving your head, that can be a successful way of, of making your selections. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of repeating myself here. You can switch, you can dwell. This is on our systems. Uh, we, we actually don't have blink. That's right. That camera isn't tracking your face. It's only tracking that dot and coordinating that with the screen. One nice thing, uh, one lingering difference between the more traditional camera based or, you know, specialty cameras that uh, we have on our accent devices and the ones on the, the built into the iPad is that you tend to have more control over the speed and movement and sensitivity of that cursor. Um, on the screen on the older approach, believe it or not. So like on our new point camera, that's what that uh, that's what that's called back here. This is the new point on a very small device, an eight inch device. Um, on this one, you can control how fast it moves in the horizontal direction for a given amount of movement and how fast it moves in the ver vertical direction for a given amount of movement. And that turns out to be pretty crucial for a lot of users using this because more often than not, left to right, the horizontal movement, you have a pretty good freedom of movement on. They have more movement that way. And then up and down can be very tiny, almost uh, imperceptible. But you can adjust the sensitivity of those dimensions separately with this type. And so that gives you a lot of control. I'm thinking of more of uh, ALS users in this case or other users who are really, you know, very mobility limited and, and hardly have even any head movement. Uh, in the newer iOS software, this cursor sensitivity is more a generic speed. Just how fast does it move around the screen? There are other, um, there's other smoothing uh, controls that you can do as well to control how jittery the movement is on the screen. Um, also, that can introduce or reduce lag. So where you move your head, how fast does that cursor track with you when you move your head? So there's kind of an inverse relationship between the jitteriness of it and the lag that's introduced. The smoother it gets, the more laggy it gets. So those are just things you're dealing with. And then that cursor dwell and selection feedback, that turns out to be very similar to what we were seeing with touch. So here's what dwell selection looks like. Um, it's it, I'm looking around the screen, I'm pointing my head around and then I settle on drink and I dwell there long enough or I hit a switch and make that selection. So I get to look around the screen. That's what's nice about a switch is you can, you're in control of the timing. What, what's difficult for a lot of users is that a lot of users who have to resort to head tracking don't have enough necessarily enough control to run a switch separately, or they can't really run a switch separately that doesn't drastically affect their head movement at the same time. So to get individuals that have good control separately like that, again, you're looking at more of an ALS type situation or um, other degenerative conditions. Here, for example, is that smoothing I talked about, reducing jitter, but slowing down the cursor at the same time. Uh, vertical adjustment and horizontal adjustment. This is just what it looks like on our um, on our Empower software. 
So I, I try to, th I kind of think of these as gas pedals for the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. How much for a given movement of my head does it move on the screen? And these are arbitrary numbers, but it's the scale kind of from one to 10 on each. And so it's nice to have that level of control for many users. Cursor feedback. Um, so there, there are, this is, there's a little bit of a difference here. Um, we do like to, we too tend to want to put on a cursor on the screen, but there's really kind of two options. There, there's really one called a cursor, the other is called a pointer. So the cursor is just like the regular mouse cursor. It's free to move anywhere on the screen and it's following along wherever the computer thinks you are pointing with your head. And you know, mostly you're gonna you're gonna have some ability to adjust the color and size of that cursor in any given system. The other option that I don't know that we have in here, no, we don't. Um, the other option instead of the cursor is to have what's called a pointer. And what a pointer does is it takes your movement, but it always presumes you're moving from button to button to button. It's not giving you anywhere on the screen. It's always saying, okay, now you're looking at this button. Now you're looking at this button. And it puts a circle on that screen. Like this one here, that's what it looks like when you are, that's okay, there's the pointer, I'm sorry. Um, the point, it confused me when it said dwell feedback, but a pointer, that's just going to lock into the center of, the, of a button. When you move off of that, but it's going to stay there until you move all the way off that button, then it jumps to the next button. And so that's just a way of letting you know you're either on a button or not. Now, that can be preferred by many users once they've learned to use the system. But early on, when you're having a hard time getting that pointer to get on the button that you want it to be on, you do kind of want that cursor there to let me know, well, how, where am I off? Because if it's not on the button you want, you don't know if you're off to the left, off to the right, up or down necessarily. Um, so that can be kind of a challenge, but advanced users often get to where they like the pointer instead and they get really fast with it. You can also even animate, you know, like it can be a little clock or, or a dot that shrinks you'll see a lot of different options for that in different systems as you're dwelling, you know, you can kind of get feedback on your progress on dwelling on a button and all the size and color changes that you can make to accommodate the user's vision are, are there for you. Selection feedback, same as I talked about with touch, really. You can, you, and but you even want this a bit more because you're not getting any of that tactile feedback. So usually, again, I'm either, either doing inverting or filling. Um, I actually, I will often turn on uh, dwell feedback. You can actually, um, you can also have feedback for when your cursor gets onto a button, you can have that button fill or, um, and, and, oh, I'm sorry, that's down here. Yeah, fill or invert or turn a border on as well to let you know, yep, you're on that button. There's all sorts of combinations of all these things, which without being hands-on can be a little bit, seem a bit overwhelming, but it just gives you full control on giving the user the feedback they need to be successful. And there's all the color options. So I'm going to check the questions before I start going in. The Oculus and other VR headsets use and facial gestures switchers. Yes, facial. I mean, I remember when the Smile Mouse came out that we, we all got very excited about it. And it still turns out to be its limited use case, but it's kind of cool. And it's really expanded to all sorts of uh, different facial expressions. So um, clinical considerations, these are just kind of things I'm going to throw out for you to ponder um, or just to be sure to think about when you're out there working with different cases. Um, there is some especially we're talking about head tracking is most often compared with eye tracking. And so there can be some cognitive and just life experience differences there. As an adult who has used computer mice all the time or, or for, you know, for years, the transition to a head mouse is very intuitive. You just, oh, I'm using, you know, I'm used to turning my head to find a point and look at things. Whereas with my eyes, that's actually a very weird thing to do and can be very disoriented. 
But for a very young child who's never, you know, whose body has never let them use a computer mouse, they haven't been, they can't do anything touch like that. Sometimes understanding that I'm using my head as a mouse, that's a, a totally novel thing. And um, it, it can be very confusing for them. So sometimes cognitively just understanding, you know, we, we need to give them a good chance to learn what the access method does and how it works. And, uh, you know, help them understand eye versus head tracking. It can be difficult for them to do that. But you can practice with low tech. Um, many, you, you can actually have a, a regular head pointer or a stylus on your head. Actually, that's another way of doing head tracking, by the way, is using a head stylus, which is it's kind of a combination of touch and head tracking. Um, but using a laser pointer uh, behind the ear or on a hat and pointing at big wall posters or you know just two big pictures up on the wall in front of you, that's something that people use for that. Um, so again, you, I mentioned before about touch, use the smallest size button that your client can access, but this is definitely something where you're going to see a lot more growth from when you start with head tracking or eye tracking and develop fluency and skill. You're going to see a lot more change in that motor skill than you do with touch. Usually with kiddos, if they're good at touch, they're good at touch by the time you're looking at at a device for them. For example, we start mini users, uh, even at two years old, on an 84 button screen, you know, where that's the grid size. We don't have all 84 buttons out. We're using that hiding and showing feature, but we're using 84 buttons. I've never started a two year old with head tracking or eye tracking on 84 buttons. Those are just too small of a targets for young eyes. Or, and for just having that necessary success early on to make this fun and motivating. We usually have to start with bigger buttons. But you're, so you are gonna see a lot more growth and change in that kind of visual and head tracking motor skill than you do typically with, with regular touch. Um, and yes, you could slowly or maybe not so slowly uh, increase the number of buttons on the screen or the grid size. Oftentimes, users will start out at, for example, on a 28-button Unity system, and then once they've really gotten pretty good at that, they'll say, let me try as many as I can, <laughs> and they'll they'll want to show off and see if they can do 60 or 84 buttons. So um, that's just going to be case by case as that person's uh, motoric skills improve and their desire for, for language and communication increases. And okay. And if you haven't seen this, I'm, I might, well, where are we at time wise? I track it again. Nope. Um, but again, I'll, I'll see if, if you haven't seen it. I don't know if you can see That's okay. Just go the back. cursor moving around the screen. Response. One yeah. thing about head tracking I'll mention incredibly oh. robust to positioning. So notice we have the screen in the normal position that he's used screens all his life, but he's kind of tilted like this. You can't do this with eye tracking as well. Eye tracking tends to, you, you do tend to want need to line up the, the screen a bit. But now this is a, notice he's probably a new user uh, to head tracking, but she's trying it on an 84 button system. He's just got really good head control as an adult or a young adult. Okay. Yes, no sloths, Patty, sloths, rich. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, little teaser there on that. See okay. that chest? Oops. Okay. I hit the next button and it starts to play again. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, Chandra. So shall I carry on with eye tracking or did anyone have any questions about head tracking? Oftentimes you'll, you'll have questions about them after you've seen both access methods. Yeah, this is definitely the your opportunity to unmute and ask questions about this if you want. Oh gosh, two access methods in fifteen minutes. All right, yeah. I'm gonna step All on right. it. But uh, well, so eye tracking is just a little bit different from head tracking in that um, it's actually tracking your pupils. It's that's what it's really. Most of the systems 
and I'm very much simplifying, very much simplifying. Uh, most of the systems have some sort of bar, usually at the bottom of the screen. I'm trying to think of any that have them at any other location. Can't think of it off the top of my head. But in here are usually infrared light sources putting out a certain frequency of infrared light and one or more cameras that are looking for the reflections from that frequency light in the, in the eyes, in the pupils. And so um, it is actually a situation where you don't want your head moving very much. Although as the systems improve, um, they get more and more robust at dealing with varieties of head movement. But really what you're doing is you're moving your eyes around the screen and it's tracking the angle of your eye and how it's, you know, the shape of your eye and where it's looking. Um, calibration is, is very necessary. I didn't mention this on head tracking, but mostly there you're not calibrating so much as you're just kind of occasionally resettering, recentering. And it's just like when I need to pick up my mouse when I get to the end of it or, and I haven't gotten as far as I want. I just pick up my mouse and I slide it around. That's kind of what you're doing with head tracking. With eye tracking, you definitely um, you definitely need to do calibration. Um, although I will say that on our uh, accent devices, we have some really good default calibrations that work for for children, uh, just because children's eyes are you know tend to be a little bit closer together. They tend to be more similar from kiddo to kiddo, and so some default calibrations can work early on for again large simple targets. Setup and positioning is very crucial still to component success. Um, basically, you're you're trying to keep your head inside an invisible box uh, that's you know anywhere from 18 to 26 inches away from the screen, and you want to keep your head stable inside that box. Now, if you're a user with ALS who is absolutely immobile except for your eye movement, you can get away with you know being um, you know. 30 some inches away uh, if, if that's necessary for your, your visual focus. Um, but typically you, you need to be in a certain box and you have your head fairly stable in there. Again, what you're gonna see, we have the same type of selection options like well, switch, but blink does get used in this one. And uh, right now on our devices, it's on our accent devices. And although there hasn't been a lot of iOS, I know Toby has had their custom iOS devices. I think they've had modules that go, that can be put onto an iPad. We now also have something called the Versa Eye, which is a case with a built-in Hebrew eye tracker that can work with an iPad that you put in there. So it's coming. Uh, eye tracking, and you know, we saw that head tracking came out a couple years ago and is getting better and better. Eye tracking is is really making its way into uh, iOS. Who knows if it's actually going to even get to the point where just the built-in camera can handle that? So that's uh, remains to be seen. Um, yes. So you really positioning is a big deal. You need to be aligned to that screen. Uh, here it says uh, twenty to twenty-four. Again, I will say you know it's designed for eighteen to twenty-six. It's gotten a little bit more flexible. Um, you know, positioning the individual's eyes in the upper one third of the screen. I usually say, try to put your nose, have the nose aiming at the center of the screen and that'll achieve the same effect. And you generally want to be aligned with the angle of the screen. You want the angle of the screen and the angle of the head aligned as well because it really is a box that you're trying to be in for the, for the benefit of where the camera is looking. Uh, this is just a quick look at uh, in Empower what it looks like when you're, you know, just kind of finding the user's eyes and getting them a good idea of positioning. It's letting you know the distance down here. You see two solid eyes in there and you're grossly centered up here. You don't have to be perfectly centered, but it helps, you know, to be, you know, again, letting you know you're kind of somewhere in that box. Uh, then you can usually get a good calibration. And oops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, you can do a number of different calibrations in most systems. They're going to give you a lot of options there. I don't know if everyone has a zero point, but that's the one I mentioned we use for kiddos. Most systems can, a lot of our users, you know, 
don't necessarily have both eyes working well together. And so sometimes we need to try to pick one or the other. Hopefully one is dominant over the other. One situation where I believe where, where eye tracking still struggles is when users have one eye that works really well for one half of the world and another eye that works well for the other half of the world. That's still probably the biggest challenge for, for eye tracking. Um, it can work, but and you definitely want to check it out, but um, can uh, also be a, tr a struggle. You can also control the eye tracking stimulus. Um, a lot of times we we, we use uh, GIFs or GIFs, depending on your flavor, um, to, to get the movement, to draw the eyes to the screen. But really, to get a really good calibration, you actually want something with a strong fixation point. That's why we get that red nose in the middle, that little dot there, something to really drag your eyes to it. Got to remember that the compute, we're not using AI yet for, calibra uh, for calibration. I bet that's coming soon as well. Um, but right now, I mean, the computers are, are not that bright. When you do a calibration, it's asking you to look at this dot that I put here and look at this dot. And it's looking for your eyes to just stop moving and fixate on a point. Well, if you're if you think, oh, I'm going to do a five point calibration to get a really good calibration on this kiddo and this kiddo is looking at his teacher or the doll on the uh, you know wall over there or, you know, turning to look at another student in the room. The more calibration points you're doing, the more bad data you're giving your, your computer and you can get really terrible calibrations. So um, you're, you're balancing that attention uh, to be able to attend to calibration points uh, with the degree of accuracy that you're needing. And so that's why we, we have that zero point calibration because early on when you're first getting started, we just want you to get to that screen and be able to pick some pretty big targets. This is an example of a five-point calibration that's really good, where we give you feedback that, yeah, you looked there, you looked there, the green is the left eye, blue is the right, and that's a good calibration. Bad calibration, oh, these are all kind of, wow, I mean, I've had worse calibrations work than this one, although this, this middle one is pretty bad. They, oftentimes, they weren't ready for it. They might have slow eye movement and didn't realize, oh, gosh, I've got to look at this thing in the middle of the screen first, so... There's some, there's, uh, there, are, there are tips and tricks to getting good calibrations that you can always ask us about. Uh, again, selection type, uh, dwell, switch, blink. Um, oftentimes, um, I, I, I've never ended up having very many blink users because a lot of blink users, um, they end up just preferring dwell and those that could maybe do it always end up moving their heads. Uh, when they blink and, and squinting a lot of things. Um, so dwell and switch are by far the most common ones. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do, again, with tracking sensitivity. Uh, some of these are really particularly useful for those that need, uh, for those that have nystagmus or other tricky eye behaviors. So there's different ways of processing the, the data that comes from the camera to improve the, the movement of the cursor. And then similar smoothing, like I saw in head, like I mentioned in head tracking, where you can get rid of the shakiness, but you introduce lag to increase smoothing. And then a lot of the same cursor dwell selection feedback that we talked about with head tracking and touch. So I'm probably gonna go through this a bit more. The dwell, that's how long I linger on the button. We talked about that as an optional one to call uh, button selection time. Uh, repeat delay, that's a, that's a situation really for advanced uh, users where, especially if someone is usually in a typing-based system where you're spelling with the alphabet and you want to do double letters and linger on a button, you can have that happen because generally we suppress repeating on a button with eye tracking. Um, again, do I use a cursor or do I use that pointer to give me that fine? The cursor tells me exactly where the computer thinks I'm looking. The pointer just snaps button to button. Um, you can control the color, the size, the same pointers options here, uh, circle, square. Do I animate it as I'm dwelling to give me that kind of feedback? And then do I, do I shade the... Do I get any other visual feedback to tell me that I'm on a button? And then that selection feedback, invert, blink, do something, let me know 
uh, give me a beep that let me know that I picked that. So all the same things tend to be available there. So um, clinical considerations here, uh, the client needs to understand that eye movement, not head movement, moves the cursor. Now, when I say needs to understand, I'm, I, that's often a, a, an organic learning and internal process for quite a while for some of our users. Um, we, we kind of try to teach them that, that, oh, I'm looking at the screen and that's moving around with my eyes. That can take a while for that to become a conscious thing. Oftentimes we're actually getting them to understand first that I'm talking with this and making mom and dad do things or, or brother and sister do things. And that's when they figure out that I'm doing this with my eyes. And they may not even explicitly understand that they're doing it with their eyes. They just know I'm making it happen. I don't necessarily know how I'm doing it. So um, often, you know, it's good to practice with low tech and, you know, use those eyes in a lot of different situations for, for making choices. Uh, choice boards, wall choice boards, similar to what I talked about with head tracking. Uh, you want to use and often come up with your own consistent terminology to help the user, you know, get their own set of cues. Your eyes showed me that, you know, oh, you did that with your eyes. I see that you looked at something like that. Again, with the smallest size button, but again here, you're going to see much more growth in the ocular motor skills. I, I'm. This is one of those things like I feel I'm not supposed to say this, but we can see improvement over time with with kiddos ocular motor skills with with eye tracking you know games and communication um i'm still a little bit befuddled why this type of equipment is not used for vision therapy routinely because we can see i mean i i obviously i'm not a visual a, a vision specialist or therapist of anything like that but wow, we see some incredible changes happen with users where people think they, oh, there's no way they could run an eye gaze device. His eyes go every which way. But when you give them something actual purposeful to do and they learn that they're making, they're in control of something in this area, all of a sudden you can see the brain kind of rewire itself and, and figure out how to use this. Uh, on the bottom here, beware of eye fatigue and plan accordingly. Uh, the younger the kiddo, the more engaging the activity, the more they don't care about eye fatigue. <laughs> and they won't even let you know. I, I remember having kiddos um, who were just entertaining uh, a whole room of adults with fart clouds on the uh, look to learn games and, you know, literal tears streaming out of his eyes, but he doesn't want to look away because he's having so much fun. We, you know, a lot of kiddos will spontaneously kind of look away, take breaks, like figure this thing out. Okay, I got to look away. But then there are some of those that will just not look away at all and just think it's the most engaging thing ever. And you've got to build up the uh, build up the endurance for that because it is a strange thing to be doing with your eyes. It really is odd to look off center and dwell at a spot. That's not really what our our visual system does. It tends to we look off center at something that's interesting and then we bring it into the center of our vision and we want to turn our head and all that. So. We got to be careful with eye fatigue. Okay. Let's see. Is that, oh, more clinical considerations here. Yeah. Help them use their eyes in a variety of ways. Um, we actually have uh, activities that are typically used for eye tracking. We also now use them uh, for, we'll, we'll use them for head tracking and even touch at times uh, to just get users, you know, getting used to, controlling the device without necessarily having to communicate. But this can be most uh, acutely useful for uh, eye tracking users. So um, real quickly, we have these systems here where uh, on engage on our accent devices where you look at a video and it plays and it runs, but when you look away, it stops. Or when you move to another video, it runs. And just they're just little clips like that. Okay, I have to move on. There's the games uh, that are great for eye tracking too. Um, I do see some questions here. So that's why I'm moving on here. Just like any muscle, yes. Your eye tracking muscles, they got to they gotta learn how to do it. 
Uh, external consider lighting. Yes, that can be a big deal. Lighting nowadays doesn't tend to matter as much in terms, uh, well, at least for for most systems, indoor lighting is, is just handled fine. Um, our systems don't actually work outside in full sun. I know there are some models of, of some companies' devices that do uh, do that. Uh, yes, I would love you to get a Versa I and the OTAP library. I would, let's make that happen. Uh, this is Master Matrix. Uh, yes, seems like the research is starting to be discussed at vision conferences. I'll just also throw, throw out there, CVI is a cortical visual impairment. It's a diagnosis we've seen kind of explode over the past, uh, you know, I think it's just our awareness of it and understanding of it has improved much over the past decade. Just because someone has CVI does not exclude them from using eye tracking. It actually is often the best access method for uh, those users. And we do have tools to help work through that as well. Okay, I'm at, and now, boy, this happens all the time. Switches just get short shrift, uh, and they really shouldn't. Because uh, I said that touch was kind of, in a way, the last of the AAC access methods, even though now it's the most popular and most common on devices. Switches were really the first of the true, you know, AAC systems. We, you know, users that could not touch, we didn't have eye tracking or head tracking. You had to, you know, click switches to make your choices or to to move through the choices. And yet uh, now it's probably the least common because it is definitely uh, the slowest type of system. And, um, and, you know, and it requires a lot of work. Um, but it's available on all Accent devices, even most uh, most companies uh, tablet based devices, usually the amp, the, the, the case that it's put into provides jacks for switches. Switches are often a, a secondary uh, backup system for a lot of users uh, that use eye tracking or other systems. Uh, so it's always, it's often good to have that as a backup. Um, but the way switches work is basically you are presented with choices uh, either by the system or you move through the choices and then you pick the one you want. Um, and the types of switches that are out there, there, there are very many types of switches out there. Uh, wireless and, and wired, I uh, mentioned here are a couple of our wireless switches. There are third-party ones, like there are EMG switches out there. There's one really good one that I wish they would let people use. Uh, outside of their communication systems, um, but those aren't widely available here. There's one in the UK, I know. Um, but there are mechanical switches, which means you actually have to make a button click. And then there are proximity switches like this candy corn up here or the switches embed in this head pad here it's called proximity, where you just have to get uh, to touch the switch or get near the switch to make it activate. Um, all sorts of variety of switches out there to find the proper, you know, find the way that this user can reliably, consistently, volitionally access the device. Um, what did I want to say about that? I think I'm just going to move on to the next one. So those are the electronic ones. So most of the time you're going to be doing one type, one or of two types of scanning. And then there's a whole bunch of other um, potential options as well. Um, first time you're going to figure out how many switches are you going to use? Are you going to be using one switch or two? This is one of those cases where more is actually often a little less confusing. Um, a, a lot of times we do try to find two switch sites for users so that they can do step scanning. Step scanning is where I move, 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 and hear my choices. And then I, I pick when I hear the one I want. When you're just using one button, you're doing what's called auto scanning. And um, there only one switch site is needed and that's great and minimal movement required. But now you've got this, this timing issue that you need to be able to activate the switch in time for before the the chooser or the the options are moved on to the next one, that can be a really big deal for a lot of our folks that need these switches. 
because timing and, and initiating movement can be exactly the thing that's difficult for them. So those are the those are kind of the really big factors that you're you're first figuring out with scanning. Can they can they hit a button within one or two seconds of being presented a choice they want? If it's any longer than that, then you start dealing with attention issues and have problems on that way. But if they have two switch locations that they can reliably do, or even uh, one hand that can move from one to another, then they're going to be in control of that timing. Now, the opposite issue, the problem with two switches is that that can be very fatiguing. You're having to hit the button a lot more times. So these are the, the constraints you're, you're trying, the factors that you're trying to balance out for that user. You're trying to find that most reliable, consistent volitional movement that they can make that doesn't fatigue them and gives them that full access. So if you don't already know auto scanning, here's one. Um, here, oh gosh, I thought it was going to play through those. Oh, I'm using my controls wrong. So auto scan, I have my hands up here. Oh my gosh, it really isn't playing. I played this last night. What's going on? Well, I'm I'm lying. Well, this is doing linear scan. And now I'm doing, I'm step scanning through. Okay, so I'm sorry, for some reason, these aren't playing like they were last night. I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, not only uh, can you decide whether you're in control of the scanning or whether the computer is gonna move you through the scanning, but you can also control how you scan through the, the, the blocks or the, the buttons. And so uh, linear scanning, that's when you just step through each and every one you just go through them. That's, that's the slowest form of scanning, although sometimes it's combined with others to be fast. And then you get to the one you want and you pick it. Um, row column scanning, that's when you're presented with a whole row of buttons and you pick the one you want. Oh, I hit my red button. And now I start moving column by column. Oh, there's the one I want. So that's a more efficient scanning method, especially when you have more buttons. Uh, then column row. That's just that way instead of row column. They're really the same, just the same, same, but different. Okay, then when you've got bigger grids of systems, you often row column is a little too slow and needs to be combined with blocks. So here we've got some custom blocks and you'll see all sorts of different systems. This is a pretty unusual one, but this one has is going through little blocks like this that are customized. And then when I get to the block I want, I pick it, and now within that block, I'm going to go through by row and column. And now I pick that row, and now I'm going to move across that column, and I say work. Okay. Tons of customizations you can do with that as well. And, um, and many of them are what we've been seeing along the lines with, uh, with touch and eye and head tracking. You know, How does that button look? Uh, when I when I get to it, what types of cues do I get? Do I get an auditory prompt? Do I get a beep? Uh, when I make the selection, you know, I hear the speech. Do I get a beep as well? Um, we have switch selection time and next switch selection delay. That's again that dwell time on a switch, and that how long do I ignore the switch before I repeat that uh, release time. Dwell and release time just for the switches instead. So you'll see that these same themes go across all of these. Okay. So, um, just I real know. quick, uh, we did have one question about oh, uh, the eye gaze oh, games. There. Oh, eye gaze games. Yes, yes. How do we access the eye gaze games? So Is there um, a best website page that you can put up or... I'll be honest, I, I know that. that there are good iGames games sites out there. Um, I'm, of course, well-versed. I'm usually using the ones that are built into ours, the Tomoko games and the grid-based games that we have built into ours. I believe Help Kids Learn um, is, is a good site that has a lot of those. But if someone wants to email me, I will, um, I will get a, a better answer of that because I think there's I think this is also something that's exploding a lot. Uh, it really uh, is, yeah. Even the past year. Um, so there's probably, I, I believe someone at my company does have a list of those. Okay. So I'll, for you. I'll email you and ask you for that. 
Deb Lesher was here. Hi, Deborah. And a list um, of your games, too. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that question? Um, and a, just a list of the games that you have, too, so that, you know, we can explore them before we're trying to put them on a student's device. Oh, yeah. So our um, on our accent devices, um, well, on a trial device, they're built in there. They automatically come with them as long as you have you have to pay the unlocking fee because of the whole dedicated versus integrated thing with AAC. You generally do have to um, integrate the device, but they're they're in there ready to go. Okay, so then the Tomoko, is that? Yeah, the Tomoko games. On accent device. And you do get okay. the engage video, the engage video games that I briefly showed there where you're just looking at the videos or, mm -hmm. you know, picking a video and it plays. That's actually um, available uh, on arrival of device for any of them. But those are all accessible during any trial device or loaner device. 